Hey, Sonic Grover here. Welcome back to my channel and welcome to a science fiction discussion. This is more a response video to this article that I happened upon late last night. And it involves the adaptation, Apple TV's adaptation of the Isaac Asimov Foundation series. And it's a pretty terrible piece. And I wanted to express my thoughts, my words concerning Isaac Asimov, who is a giant among the sci-fi greats, the writers of the 20th century. And I've, I've got to really uh, stand up for this piece of literature. Uh, that is the Foundation series. Now, before getting into this article, I do need to express a few things. I have not and will not, will not ever be watching this adaptation. Like what with what we've seen before in the last decade, really, with all the television and, and film adaptations of these beloved stories and these characters, you could probably make the educated guess that uh, this is not a faithful adaptation. This is not faithful to the vision that Isaac Asimov had with his classic literature. So I have no reason to watch it. In fact, I would highly recommend you don't watch it. If you're curious about what Asimov was all about, go read his books, go read the Foundation series, Go read his short fiction. His short stories are great. And that's all I have to say about that. The second thing is any of my sentiments is based off my reading of the Foundation trilogy. Now, I do understand that this show probably, if I have this correct, I think the show is basically the prequel uh, or the series of events before the actual Foundation trilogy. I, I am not sure. I really don't know what that's about. I have not read the prequel stories myself. Uh, so we've got two books, two prequel books, then the trilogy. So five books and then two other books after the trilogy. This is, you know, books where the stories and events take place after the main events of the Foundation trilogy. I've only read the Foundation trilogy uh, twice now. I, I read it 10 years ago. I loved it. I remember enjoying it very much. And then I picked it up just last fall. And I really do enjoy it these books, these stories. And I've also read One's Foundation's Edge, which is the subsequent story after, you know, following the trilogy. And I'm reading it again. And I, I like it. I, I'm only, you know, in the into the first five chapters or so. But again, I really do enjoy these stories. So my knowledge and my, my reaction to this article is just based on reading the trilogy twice and then Foundation's Edge, if, if it ever comes up. But I don't think it will. So I haven't read the prequel stories. I'm looking forward to that. And then I'm looking forward to completing the series. But with all of that out of the way, let's go ahead and read this article, if you would even call it that. <laughs> all right, this is by Inverse. I really don't know much about the publisher, but uh, its content is what we are talking about today. So let's read. Foundation is fixing the trickiest thing about the Asimov books. Hmm. Would you like to take a guess on what that is? The subheading reads, Isaac Asimov was a science fiction giant. But th this version, the version of Foundation, addresses one place the books fell short. And every time we are reading Foundation in this article, it is talking about the show, not the books. The Foundation novels by Isaac Asimov may very well be one of the best science fiction book series of all time. That is true. Stands right up there with Dune. And he continues, the current Apple TV Plus series based on those books is easily one of the top five best contemporary sci-fi TV shows airing right now, period. First of all, it's a really clunky sentence. Contemporary still means present day or present time. So don't use the word contemporary with right now. Just, just leave it out. Uh, second is that that's not really any praise to say, oh, this is one of the top five best sci-fi series airing right now, as opposed to things airing, you know, eight months from now, you know, two years from now. So that's not really worthy praise. Anyway, let's continue with what he has to say. But what makes Foundation unique, Foundation the show, unique among sci-fi book adaptations is that it dramatically improves upon its source material and outright corrects aspects of the novels which simply don't work today. So there are two big issues with this sentiment. This is this is a very audacious remark. He first says that it's very unique in that it dramatically improves upon its source material, saying, 
we've got better ideas with these stories. We've got better ideas than what Isaac Asimov had when he wrote all his science fiction in the 60s. We have something better in mind that we're going to use all his places and names and stuff like that. So it's that that's what makes it unique and special, guys. That's the first big problem right there. It's like, no, just work with the source material. Adapt the source material. Use what's in the text. But apparently they didn't for this show. The second problem, he says, is that it outright corrects aspects of the novels which simply don't work today. That's not a good statement either because I just read the trilogy this last fall in the year 2022, and I still enjoy those stories. This is a very good piece of fiction, and I highly recommend anyone who is serious about reading science fiction, and especially about writing science fiction, got to go to the trilogy. It's very thought-provoking. It's engaging, and Asimov is really shining the brightest with this trilogy. So this is outright wrong, <laughs> where he says, he's like, oh, well, you know, these, these ideas, these aspects don't work today. No, that's not true. Um, Asimov's trilogy, Foundation Trilogy, can still stand the test of the past decades as it has and future decades. It, it's okay. The content is okay. I endorse it. Sound Engraver endorses it. Uh, continuing, he says, in the fifth episode of Foundation, season two, one of the most powerful characters in the show, Queen Sereth, um, that's how I'm going to pronounce her name because I don't know how it is pronounced, uh, who is Ella Ray Smith, challenges the Emperor of the Galaxy, Brother Day, in a way that the characters from Asimov books never could. And I'm going to get into that a little bit later with this with this article, that, that she presents this wonderful challenge to this Emperor in, in a way where, where none of the characters of the Asimov books could. It's like, well, okay, is, is that such praise? We're going to get into why I think all of that is unnecessary. Like season one before it, Foundation season two pushes back against one of the things that make the classic novels tricky for contemporary audiences. The novels often lack female characters, or they say strong female characters, which is something the show tackles head on, especially in season two, episode five, yada, yada. Now, this also, this sentiment here is also problematic because at least with the trilogy, we have two main female characters that we follow. We have a main female character we follow in the second book of the trilogy, and another female character, her granddaughter even, in the third book of the trilogy. And especially Beta, the the, the first um, female character that we do see and following her perspective, she really does something very, very important in the end of the second book. And that's good enough for me. It is true with Foundation, the first book, we don't see any female characters, at least I think there might be one or two mentions of women, but they're kind of vain because we're kind of working with politicians and, and people in, in warring kingdoms and, and stuff like that. But this statement that Mr. Ryan Britt is saying is false. Uh, I, I guess he has to put in the word um, often here. Uh, the, the novels often lack female characters. I guess that's a, an operative word, but we have two main female characters that we follow. So moving along down, he writes, in one pivotal scene from this episode five, Queen Sereth challenges Brother Day, the emperor, about their impending arranged marriage. In a tense scene, Sereth makes it clear to Day that she's only interested in marrying him and having an heir because it's good for her kingdom, Cloud Dominion. Now, I don't know if Cloud Dominion is an actual place. I have not read the prequel books, um, so it could very well be a place of Asimov's. Um, but, you know, this is just an aside. It's it's yet another, you know, representation of how bad marriage is. And, oh, no, the, the, the powerful woman can't be married to, to a guy. Now, I'm not saying the emperor is a good guy. You know, even presented in the books, he's kind of egotistical. He wants to not only arrest Harry Seldon at the beginning, he wants to execute Seldon for daring to bring up such knowledge that could thwart his power and undermine his power and threaten his kingdom. So in the books, he's not represented as anyone good. He is egotistical. He is arrogant. And he's only, it's his appearance is only short-lived 
in relation to Selden. So I'm not defending whoever this emperor is, if, if, if even this is a good, accurate uh, representation of the emperors in the prequels. But it's just another, you know, representations, kind of the sentiment like, oh, you know, strong women are would only marry for the good of her own being or her own, you know, you know, will to, to 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 purpose good for her kingdom or for her institute or whatever. This is getting to be a tired trope, and marriage should not always be seen as a hard or vile or bad thing. Moving on, he writes, and the book's Queen Sereth doesn't exist. Well, then that's a problem. And although there is a Cleon one or Cleon the first in Asimov's prequel books, okay, so there is. Prelude to the Foundation, or Prelude to Foundation, and Forward the Foundation, those, those first two books before the trilogy. He's not a serial clone in those novels, so okay, they're making major changes there. And the inherent patriarchy he creates isn't addressed at all. Okay, as far as patriarchy, the word, you know, if you're dealing with an emperor who is male, there's going to be some built-in hierarchy anyway, with the term patriarch or patriarchy. Th this in this context, the word patriarchy shouldn't be the same as how we <laughs> in North America, in, in the United States, use, you know, flippantly use that word in, in the cultural um, colloquial colloquialism. I, I just I just do not like the colloquial. I don't like the changes of words, the, the changes of meaning. And and he's putting this this writer here is putting the word patriarchy in the same vein, running in through the same vein as as like he's he's putting the meaning as of how we or how society is using the word flippantly today and how an emperor or the context of the world involving the empire would. This doesn't make sense. So that's an aside. Uh, that's a little bit of a rant, but let's continue. So uh, just just to say about the emperor, um, he's uh, he, he is mentioned in the prequels, uh, the pre the prequel books. Uh, in fact, here overall, Asimov's novels contain few strong female characters at all. That doesn't matter. And, and there's a reason for that. So his novels contain few strong female characters at all, especially in the original three novels of the trilogy, Foundation, Foundation and Empire, and the second Foundation, those books that I have read twice. While it's true that the Foundation and various powers do destabilize the Foundation in the classic books, which is true, there wasn't a great character like Queen Sereth at the center of it. I got to stop right there. So let's highlight that. There wasn't a great character like Queen Sareth at the center of it. This is not necessary because really in the events that play out through those books, especially the first book, Foundation, it is really the inevitable because of Selden's psycho history. So he's a psycho historian. He, he mentors, before he passes away, he mentors another psychohistorian, and also the, the people involved making up this uh, uh, encyclopedia, Galactica. And basically, psychohistory, in, in <laughs> layman's terms, and, and it, really just scratching the surface because it's a highly complex uh, narrative anyway, these books. Um, but psychohistory is not based on any social thing, based on any individual's purpose or in any individual's uh, agenda. Psychohistory is the mathematics involved with the psychology of mass reaction, meaning events that take place, major events that take place, like, like the, the, the collapse of an empire, for instance, is all due to mass reaction to things, not individual reaction to things. Now, there is a little bit of an exception with individual characters who are mayors, who are traders, uh, different merchants, uh, different people trying to work out, um, uh, I would say not manipulate in a bad way, but manipulate because there are other forces at work trying to undo or undermine the Selden plan to basically reduce the time of this catastrophe, the Dark Ages. Selden with his plan is trying to ensure that instead of a dark age, a galactic dark age of 30,000 years, he's with his own psychohistory and knowledge, he's trying to reduce it to an interim of 1,000 years before 
a renewing of a new empire, a new and stable empire. He's trying to reduce 30,000 years of just barbarism to a mere 1,000. Now, yeah, that's terrible for those people living in the 1,000 years, but it, it's certainly so much better than 30,000 years. So anyway, all that aside, his science and his mathematics is really, it, it's it's knowing what's going to happen in the future because of sociology and social reaction to different things. So it doesn't make sense for a great queen to take the center stage because it's about mass reaction. And, and an individual, even if they are a politician or a ruler, can only do so much to, to thwart the inevitable uh, that is within the Selden plan. Even more so, we're introduced in the books a very fascinating character called the Mule. And he is the threat. I'm not going to spoil anything because it's awesome. But he is the threat to the Selden plan. And he, because of a very specific trait of his, he is able to undermine the the, the prediction uh, that Harry Selden is playing out saying, hey, this is what's about to happen. These are the events. This is the fall of the empire. And only the mule, this very enigmatic character, can undo the entire process because of a very specific situation, a very specific trait of his. And only the mule can do it. This is very important. The queen cannot. So this queen, this great queen at the center of it, is in fact unnecessary at best, but also contradictory at worst. So moving along, just had to say that. Just the existence of this character not only creates an amazing foil to the Cleon dynasty in the show's canon, but provides an amazing counterbalance to the male-dominated novels. This is ridiculous because the foil to the emperor and the current empire is only Harry Seldon and his knowledge. Only his knowledge of psychohistory and what it is about to ensue. That is the inevitable downfall of the emperor, the emperor Cleon I, and the empire. No one else, nothing else. Foundations feminism. Yay, doesn't she look smart? And she's she's a go-getter. Yeah. Actually, the set behind her kind of looks like Star Wars or or some other, you know, well, I don't know. It just looks a little generic. I Asimov, man, he has a he has a very distinct look in his story, especially with his robots and stuff. I just oh my gosh. Asimov should not look like Star Wars. I just gotta say that. Let's continue. All right. In addition to Sereth, I'm going to highlight these. In addition to Sereth, one of the remarkable thing about the foundation is how it manages to sidestep its male-focused characters to the point where it actually scans this as a feminist show, at least relative to the book. So he, he is comparing the show, this writer is comparing the show to the books in that, well, we did lack a lot of female characters in the book, so... Um, in order to do that, we got to kind of sidestep them or, or gender swap, you know, the, 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 the <laughs> colloquial, dare I use the, the, the colloquial of our times, but yes, um, these characters are switched out from being men to being women. So he goes on to say heroic characters like Gail Dornick and Salvor Hardin, uh, who are men in the books are women now in the show. Why? Um, we'll, we'll get to Salvar Hardin in, in, in a bit, but let me keep reading. Um, the near immortal robot uh, Demerzel uh, it was also presented as male in, in these books. So whether the prequels or the what, what follows the trilogy, I think he's talking. I think this character does appear in the prequels. I'm just not sure. Um, but as played by uh, uh, Laura Byrne in the show, uh, Demerzel is the true power behind the toxic male Clayons who actually only um, appear to be in power. So it's interesting. They're, they're setting up this, I guess, female robot character who's really the mastermind behind it all, you know, who um, the, the the men only appear to be in power. So, okay, so here's, here's the thing I want to talk about. As this 
non-existent character, Queen Sarath, is coming to learn her enemy might not be Brother Day at all, but instead Demerzel, or however you pronounce that name. Um, so the actual power struggle, at least on a galactic stage, isn't between Harry Seldon and the Empire, but instead between Sarath and Demerzel. Now, let's talk about Harry Seldon. Oh, well, yeah, him too, but let's talk about Salvor Hardin. Salvor Hardin, he goes up against political forces in very bombastic and very clever ways. Uh, I will not spoil anything. Um, this this video is, before it gets too long, I don't want to go into deep analysis with the narrative of the books. Uh, I will one day because it's, it's, it's fascinating. But Harry's, uh, not him, <laughs> he's cool too. But Salvor um, Salvor Hardin is one of my favorite characters. He is so energetic. He's kind of like, we, we come across him like when he's in his late 20s. And then we finish his story when he's, I think, approaching 60. And he's he's energetic. He's charismatic. He flirts with uh, the law and, and, and legalities of se certain social situations only because he wants to make sure that the people of Terminus, they're doing all right. And and based, <laughs> I, I, I won't go into it unless unless called for, but he's a very engaging, very interesting character. Every time he talks, I like listening to him. Uh, very interesting, uh, very dynamic man. Um, and you're you're he's pretty much the first person major character that you you follow in, in the sequence of events. And a lot of time jumps in the story structure. I know that's not um, uh, most people aren't a fan of that, but based based on what the narration has to be, the narrative has to be with uh, foundation trilogy, it's kind of a given it has to be that. And Salvar Hardin um, is one of the first uh, people that you you see and and I instantly liked him. He he had a great great personality. But now he switched out. He I think I, I don't know um I don't know if this is the character. Uh oh oh no, this is this is Galdarnik. Um so another character, but they look alike. <laughs> they they they're, they're the same age and they 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 look like sisters. I'm sorry if that's problematic, but that's what they do. Meanwhile, on the other side of the galaxy, uh, Gale and Salvor have may have to contend with Harry Seldon's um, eccentricities, but it has become rapidly clear that Gal's agency or Gale's agency is superior to Harry's. Okay, first of all, uh, Gal Dernick is not really mentioned in, uh, like, he's, like, mentioned the first two chapters of the trilogy, um, and he he basically is, is set up as Seldon's mentee before Seldon passes away. Now, this is really concerning, just, just this sentence here, because Gail, or Gal, or, I, I'm not really sure how to pronounce his name, um, but Gal and Salvor, in the book, they're different times, okay? So with Gal Dornick, he's, I think he's probably a young man of, of, in his 20s, but Harry Seldon at this time is just a few years, if not less than that, fewer than that, before he's, he's dead. He's a very old man at the start of the book. Um, and so he's, he's become in Dornick is the, the mentee of this very, very old mathematician. Salver, on the other hand, is this upstart we see in his late twenties in, I don't want to say upstart in a negative way. He's just very charismatic and he wants to do the right thing for Terminus. Terminus is now established as a backwater. It was a backwater planet. And then it, it, Harry Seldon, um, is exiled there by the emperor, and then Harry Seldon begins this foundation. Now, Salvar Hardin doesn't appear in the story in the books until, I believe, almost 50 years after the foundation is set up, and he's in his late 20s. So if I have that correct, he's not even alive, like until decades later when when Harry Seldon passes away. So the fact that Salvar, Salvar Hardin is if, if he is at all with Harry Seldon and Harry Seldon's not an old man because I did see the actor, this is a problem. You're you're working with a chronological, a gross chronological error at that. So I, I don't know the context of the show, but um, if they're all together and Seldon is fairly young and uh, Gail and Salvor are at the same age, that's not cool. <laughs> they're not even supposed to see each other in the stories. Anyway, moving on. So of uh, so and basically saying so, Ga Gail Dornick, who is a mentee to Selden and very young, I think he's in his twenties or whatever. That's how I pictured him. Um, they say here this this person, uh, uh, what's his name, Ryan Britt, says here that that uh, Gail's agency is is agency is superior to Harry's. That's dumb. 
okay, Harry Seldon has decades over over Dornick, Gail Dornick. So this is a problem. And so uh, the actress says, you've never really seen a sci-fi character like her before. Yeah, you probably have. And you're just not watching and you're certainly not reading. Uh, she gets so much put on top of her, so much responsibility. It can be isolating for her as she was in season one, but it's different now. I, I don't know about that and I don't care. Um, but I hate, I hate, I just hate it, whether it's an interview or whatever. We're, we're, we're actresses, especially actresses, but actors too. They, they say about their characters, like, it's the first thing ever. Like, oh my gosh, we haven't seen someone like her before. I'm like, you just have not read science fiction. You've not seen science fiction, okay? Um, stop it with like, I'm the first as ever. Stop. It's, it's so amateur. It's so dumb. Anyway, continuing. All right. Unlike season one, Gail's mentor, Harry, is unmoored and without answers, which is something Jared Harris intended in his performance in season two. So I'm assuming Jared Harris is the actor who plays Harry Seldon. Let's start, or stop rather. I'm going to start. Let's start with this. Um, we'll stop reading. That's what I meant to say. Um, unmoored and without answers. Okay, this is this is so dumb in relation, uh, you know, compared with the books, because unmoored means unanchored. You know, he's he's drifting. He's probably lost in his thoughts. He's probably doubting. He's probably so uncertain. That's not the nature of his specialty in mathematics. He is at death's door in the books. He is a probably not crippled, but he is an old man. He knows he his time is short and he's got to get this message across. He's got to start his mission before he dies. And he knows without a doubt that his science and mathematics will ensure what needs to be ensured. He He's not limitless in knowledge. He's not omnipotent or um, omnis... Um, uh, I can't say the word right now. Um, all knowing. <laughs> Let's just say that. You know what word I'm thinking about. He he's not limitless in, in that respect, but he knows his science. And he is with answers. He he is that uh really until we get into the second book of the trilogy, but it's not his fault. <laughs> but I'm not gonna spoil anything. But by and large, he is fixed in his position. And he is knowledgeable in his position and he has his answers. People wait for decades to see what he's about to reveal if it is in line with the sequence of events, you know, decades and many, 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 many generations and years later. He is on point until a very cl cl climactic point in the second book. And it's a wonderful read there. But he's got answers. Harry Seldon has answers. That was Asimov's purpose with this character before he passes away. Uh, not Asimov, even though he's long past, but with Harry Seldon. Okay. So he's got answers. He's not doubtful. He's not doubting his knowledge. He's not, I, I bet, I bet they're depicting Jared Harris here. I bet he's depicting this character as like, oh, I'm not sure. Dornick, you know, you, you know, you're, there's something special about you that I have not yet obtained for myself. You know, tell me the answers. I, I bet that's where they're staring at, but whatever. That is not Harry Seldon, and that's not Isaac Asimov. Moving on. Instead of being the all-knowing old man, which he's not, I mean, he's he's got a science of prediction, but we see later why he is not all-knowing. Uh, instead of being the all-knowing man with the answers, which he has, this version of Harry we see in the episode is having to face his own arrogance. Now, now let's 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 let let that sink in for a second. This character has to face his own ego. He has to face his own arrogance. Well, remember, if I you know scroll up to the top here, what did they say earlier? They said. What's unique about the show is that it dramatically improves upon its source material. Right there. Right there. It's unique. It's remarkable because we improved upon its source material. You're talking about books that have stood the test of decades, that are still relevant in the science fiction world today. And you're, you're saying that Harry Seldon needs to, you know, you know, check his ego at the door. And, and he's facing arrogance because he's so smart or whatever. That's so bad. 
Anyway, continuing on, his, uh, he's obviously more vulnerable, Harris told Inverse, prior to the strike, and thank goodness. Now we don't have to see the undoing of Asimov because of the strike. Anyway, he continues and says, I was trying to get away from the idea that he knows everything because that just sucks all the dramatic possibility out of every single scene. And this is where you don't know the story. This is where you don't understand. You have no comprehension of what this story and what the main trilogy is about. People have made complaints to Asimov, whether directly to him, I, I'm not sure, but they have made complaints about the trilogy because because um, Selden does have a science. He has mathematics that predict the future. So how how is there dramatic tension if we already know what's going to happen, that we all already know that the, the, the galactic empire is doomed to collapse in on, on itself? What, what's the whole what's the whole tension there if we already know what's going to happen the tension is not what's going to happen because we we know what's going to happen the tension is all about the people involved and individually uh, reacting to the selden plan because on the one hand you've got people who want to make sure that selden not only is right about his prediction but that they are going in lockstep with him so they ensure a much shorter dark age a much shorter galactic dark age. They want him to be right and they want to ensure, I guess as a collective e effort, you know, different, again, it's really complicated, but they want to ensure that he is right and that they were seeing the course of events played out as he's predicted. The problem with that is they've got political enemies who want to, who want to intervene and, 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 you know, overthrow Terminus and, and overthrow the foundation. And then the foundation's having its, its spats with different people they probably shouldn't have spats with and stuff like that. And there's all these people who do indeed have their own egos. They need to check out the door because there, there are, there are generals that want to usurp emperors and there, there are people, there are warlords, you know, uh, war, duking it out and, and and everyone wants to uh, find this magical technology you know basically because they don't have technology except at terminus and 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 all these things that people are greedy they want wealth they want to hold their power that's where the tension is not oh but we already know that the empire is going to collapse well, what's what's the big deal then what are the stakes the stakes happen in between Selden and his commissioning his plan and everything that happens after it for a thousand years for at least for many centuries okay so that's all that and then and this is where this tv show will never get any character like the mule the mule is an enigma that can undo all of it and enforce maybe not a dark age of you know 30,000 years but his own tyrannical vengeful empire not the empire that Selden was hoping for with his mathematics and his psychohistory. That is what the Foundation trilogy is about, what the series is about. This is a blatant contradiction. It says, I was trying to get away from the idea that he knows everything just because it sucks out all the drama, uh, the dramatic possibility out of, you know, from every scene. It's like, yeah, even if you know what's going to happen, it's like, oh, a tsunami's coming. Uh, oh, shoot, we're stuck here. What do we do? Yeah, you know, the tsunami's coming. But the, the tension is what you're going to do if you're going to escape or endure, okay? So you, you can still have tension knowing what's going to happen in the future. Anyway. And uh, finally, this article ends with this last point from Harris, the actor, actually sums up what makes... Let's, let's, let's isolate this for a second. <sighs> This last point from Harris actually sums up what makes Foundation Season 2 so compelling in a show about predicting the future. We don't know what's going to happen next. This is like an art student going to a professor with a piece of crud, piece of garbage, and saying, look, this actually, this art prof is really profound, okay? Because, yeah, you're seeing it this way, but actually I meant it to be this way, so it's really profound. That's what the sentence is saying. It's like, well... It's about, it's about predicting the future, but we still don't know what's going to happen next. It's because you're doing it the wrong way. You were doing it the wrong way. It's not how the books play out. 
So uh, he concludes right now, the only thing we do know is that the intellectual brilliance of Asimov's books continue to shine through. No, it doesn't because you're not going anywhere near the actual narrative, the very most important thought-provoking narrative of the trilogy. So no, you're not following the intellectual brilliance of Asimov's stories. You're just not. And, and don't say you are uh, because that is actually a lie, a fabrication or misconception. You pick, but it's not truth. Only now, Foundation is no longer just a boys' club. It's anyone's club who take the book seriously, who enjoy the books, like the stories, and take the book seriously. Okay? It's like, it's, it's no longer a boys' club. Well, it's a yes queen's club, and I don't want to be part of that. Well, I'm not part of that because I'm not watching the show. Um, but anyway, this was a long rant um, for a very short article, but I just, I got to defend, I got to defend these stories. Uh, this is nowhere near what Asimov had for his stories. They are blatantly contradicting not just the overall story. In fact, that's more important than the characters. I will say, um, before concluding this video, I will say that the Asimov trilogy, the Foundation trilogy, is not character-driven. Not really until, I would say, probably the second half of the second book and into the third book. There's a little bit more linear uh, flow with those books. And Foundation's Edge, it's even, I would say, even better if I remember correctly. The first book, no. You, you are jumping major time jumps and you are following a mayor here, a traitor there, you know, a, a politician here. So you kind of have to expect that, but you're, you're crossing a lot of ground. What makes this story, what makes these books amazing and, and standing the test of time is the thought-provoking narrative of how to keep intention, how to work with something you already know is going to happen and what can be the contradiction and what can be societies, but also, you know, on the galactic scale, what is going to be the reaction and how are you going to um, assuage chaos, you know, and how are you going to work with that? It's it's good. It's thought provoking. Uh, it's it's on a human, fundamentally human scale. Though I would say the characters are uh, are a little flamboyant, but that but that those were the caricatures of of the pulp fiction of that time. Um, anyway, that's that's an aside. I don't want to get this video any longer. Make this video any longer than it already is. But that is my defense of Isaac Asimov and the Foundation trilogy, at least and my dissertation of really i'm just scratching the surface of what those books are about they're highly conceptual highly intellectual um, but this piece of garbage this article and then also the show it praises absolute trash it's farce it's not real it's not asimov it's only using maybe asimov's world and maybe not even the characters because i don't think these are his characters uh i, I gotta defend my, my my boy Harry Seldon. Oh wait, yeah, him too. Uh, yes, of course, uh, he's he's first, but also Salvar Hardin. He is an amazing character in the books. He's very interesting, and just a lot of interesting characters anyway. And yeah, there are a few, maybe one or two female characters. They're interesting too. And whoever you are, whatever age, whatever social background, whatever. If you like science fiction, if you want to have some thought provoking ideas and concepts, go read the true Asimov Foundation series. And don't bother with this show. This is this is just Game of Thrones with spaceships, okay? Um, this is not Asimov, not at all. And uh, that's all I have to say. So thank you for listening to me rant for 40 some odd minutes, and uh, I will uh, see you next time.